final panel discussion that sits between you and lunch, and it's titled Prompting Indigenous Culture, Land and Heritage with Indigenous Knowledge. And we have a panel um, to discuss this, and I'd ask the panel please to come up on the stage. And I will just quickly introduce each of the panel members, but there should be more information online um, about, about them. So um, Associate Professor Lisa Palmer, who just asked a question in the last session, is a writer, a filmmaker. She's an academic here at the University of Melbourne. Uh, she's published two books um, focused on Timor-Leste, and she's also made two films. Um, and she might talk more about the processes of that today. Um, Rachel Nordlinger is a professor of linguistics and a director of the research unit for Indigenous language here at the University of Melbourne. And her research focuses on the description and documentation of Indigenous languages in Australia. Dr. Kirsty Sword Guzmal carries out research in the School of Geography here at the university, and she's a goodwill ambassador for the education of Timor Leste and the chair of the Alola Foundation. And last but not least, Professor Barry Judd is Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous and Director of the Indigenous Studies Program in the School of Culture and Communication here at the university. So there's going to be some short presentations, starting with Rachel, I think. Um, and then a panel discussion, and then I'll come up and, and, and pass on some of the questions that you guys are going to put in the chat. Thanks very much. Yes, so that'd be great. Okay. Um, oh, so should I stand up here? You might want to leave the mic because that mic is on. Oh. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I, let me just check that my slides are... What do I... Oh, I click on the green button, perhaps. Mm. Oh, there we go. You want it back? Great. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the uh, custodians of the unceded lands that... Um, I speak to you from today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge all Indigenous people in the room and uh, listening to the presentation. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Woiwurrung language as the language of this land and also Boonwurrung as well as a, a language of the broader Melbourne area. Now, as I am sure everybody in this room is well aware, Australia is a place of enormous linguistic diversity. There's hundreds of First Nations languages across the continent. And I particularly like this map, which I have borrowed from the Australian Geographic, which um, I think gives a beautiful reflection of the, the number of languages across the continent. And these languages are centrally important to issues of culture and land and heritage in many, many ways. And I won't have time to talk about all of the ways. Uh, so in my allocated few minutes, I just want to focus on the relationship of language to knowledge. And it's sort of perfect that I've just followed that wonderful presentation we just had, which um, illustrated many of the points that I will reinforce. So um, quite well scheduled in that respect. So language and knowledge are intricately related as we saw in that presentation and as people probably know already. And so it follows that First Nations languages are therefore central to protecting and uh, strengthening and understanding Indigenous knowledge. We can't really truly understand Indigenous knowledge without also uh, appreciating and understanding the, the languages which have carried that knowledge for millennia. Um, and so through interesting, through Indigenous languages, we find, we, when, we, when we look at them, we can find really interesting examples of, uh, that express cultural knowledge, ecological knowledge, environmental knowledge, scientific knowledge. Uh, and often this knowledge gets lost in translation. So I'm going to give you some examples from uh, some different Indigenous languages and the way in which we can see different types of knowledges expressed through language. So this is a, an example from a language, Gunwingu, and I've shown you sort of where it's located or where its country is on the map. 
Um, it's one of my favourite examples illustrating the, the depth of knowledge of the natural world that gets reflected in Indigenous languages. So in English, if you want to talk about the way a kangaroo or a wallaroo or a wallaby moves, we, we generally say it hops or it jumps. And you just use the one verb for any of those sorts of animals and also for frogs and rabbits and people as well. But in Gunwingu, there are different verbs that describe not only the different moving actions of wallabies versus wallaroos and so on, but and not even only for different species of wallabies and wallaroos, but also even different genders. So the, the hopping of a male antilopine wallaby, you would need to use the verb gamawurame. But the hopping of a female antilopine wallaby, you would need to use the verb gajalwatme, and so on. And these are all completely unrelated verbs. Now, obviously, in order to, to speak Gunwingu properly, and in order to know which verb you're going to use when you're talking about the movement of, of an animal going past you, you need to have really detailed and intricate knowledge of these species, how they differ from each other, but also how the different types of animals move in different ways. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even realise they moved in different ways, so I wouldn't even begin to know which verb to use. So by seeing this array of verbs like this, we can really understand how, what the depth of knowledge the Gunwingu speakers must have about this aspect of their environment. Uh, another example comes from Kaidelt, uh, spoken up on um, Bentic Island. Uh, and Kaidelt has 12 different terms referring to different life stages of the dugong. Now, I've just put a few up here on the slide to show you. Again, they're completely unrelated words. They have to all be learned separately from each other. And again, in order to know which word you should be using when you're talking about a dugong, you need to know a lot about how to recognise the life stages of a dugong. You need to know whether this is a young dugong or an old dugong or a female and so on. Once again, reflecting this really um, detailed knowledge of the environment. We also find words reflecting detailed knowledge of cultural practices. So this example here is from Kuktayor from Cape York. And Kuktayor has the word mankwarkant, which can be translated into English as to go from one place to another using an indirect route so that you don't come across or come close to someone for whom you're in a, an avoidance relationship or a taboo relationship. Now, we can translate it like that in, into English, but really what sits behind this translation is a really complex uh, cultural practice of kinship, knowing how you're related to everyone, knowing what that relationship means, who are the kin that you are in a taboo or avoidance relationship with, what's the appropriate behaviour towards those kin. All of that cultural knowledge is actually part of the meaning of this word. It can't be separate it and you can't know how to use this word properly and you can't know how to use this language properly without having an understanding of that cultural practice. And my final example uh, showing um, interesting example of, of how ecological knowledge and uh, can get reflected through language. So again from Gunwingu there's this word manyawok and manyawok is used to refer to a particular species of grasshopper, the one there on the slide. It's also the word for a particular uh, species of cheeky yam. And it's also the word to describe the time of year that's the end of the wet season. Now, you might look at that and think, well, you know, that's just homonyms. We have homonyms in language. It's just one word that has three different meanings, not necessarily related. But in fact, they're intricately related. So the, uh, the grasshopper calls out and is noisiest at the end of the wet season. That also is the time at which that particular species of yam is best harvested. So that ecological connection between the time of year, the species of grasshopper and the harvesting of the yam is actually being captured in the language through using this one word to refer to all of those three things. We're seeing the relationship. And to get back to the point I made at the beginning, this, this sort of knowledge is at risk of being lost when you translate. Because, of course, once we translate this into English, we've just got a grasshopper and a cheeky yam and 
the, wet, the end of the wet season, and that connection isn't being reflected in the language anymore. So for this reason, it's important that the discussion of Indigenous knowledge also be done hand in hand with the discussion of Indigenous language, and particularly when those knowledge holders that we might be working with or talking to are speakers of First Nations languages. It's really important that we engage with this knowledge in the language of the knowledge holders and really try to avoid translation as much as possible so that we don't miss all of this important knowledge that's tied up in language. Um, and of course then it's also crucially important that Indigenous languages be protected and supported so that we can protect and support the Indigenous knowledge that they carry. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. My name is Kirsty Sword Gushmaung, and um, as well as being a research associate here at Melbourne University and chair of the Alola Foundation in Timor, I'm also the CEO of a small not for profit organisation called Wurdungan, based here in Melbourne, which um, serves as a bridge between philanthropic bodies and Aboriginal community controlled organisations across Victoria, basically working to ensure that Aboriginal organisations um, benefit from a larger share of the philanthropic uh, pie than they currently do. It's estimated at somewhere between 2 and 8 per cent, which um, speaks to the economic disadvantage um, referred to by Troy earlier. So I'm going to speak to you briefly today about traditional knowledge systems in uh, Timor-Leste and to echo some of what um, Rachel has just referred to in relation to the key role that Indigenous languages play in the preservation and promotion of these knowledge systems. So Timor-Leste is a very small nation geographically but with tremendous um, ethnic and cultural diversity within its national boundaries. There are some 17 local, mostly Austronesian languages spoken across the half island nation. In addition to the official languages of Portuguese, being the former colonial language, of course, and Tetum, um, which is a, a lingua franca amongst Timor's local languages. Language policy, in particular in relation to language of instruction in schools, has been a very hotly contested space in an independent Timor-Leste. And I talked at some length in last year's um, symposium about uh, this issue of language of instruction and language uh, in education policy, um, yes, at last year's symposium. I guess it shouldn't surprise anyone that um, one of the legacies of centuries of Portuguese uh, colon colonialism is that many Timorese, particularly amongst the political elite, tend to um, undervalue their own culture and languages and accord a far higher status to Portuguese. In 2010, I worked with our Timor-Leste National Commission for UNESCO to launch a mother tongue-based multilingual education pilot program in response to very low levels of um, educational attainment, including extremely poor reading proficiency at the early um, in the early years of primary education. The pilot program advocates for the use of local languages at the preschool and early primary levels with a gradual transition to the official languages of Tetum and Portuguese. It's proved to be extremely successful in terms of um, helping children with acquiring early literacy skills and achieving proficiency across all curriculum areas. The key to the mother tongue's pilot, uh, mother tongue pilot success is quite simple. When you can understand the teacher and the content of your books and your lessons, you can learn better. Um, it might come as a surprise, but sadly, 40% of the global population does not access ed education in a language that they understand. Nevertheless, the pilot and the whole issue of mother tongue education has been the subject um, of heated debate and quite fierce protests from um, amongst sections of the population, which see it as retarding modernisation and development. 
Um, interestingly, I've noticed in Timor Leste that public perceptions of Indigenous languages have grown somewhat more positive in the last five or so years as the world goes on higher alert in relation to the climate change emergency. And ordinary people from all walks of life are feeling its effects and reflecting on the devastating consequences of Euro-Western notions of development and economic growth. Um, as Rachel has pointed out, um, languages encode a vast array of vital Indigenous knowledge, including understandings of how to manage scarce resources like water and how to look after the land and other natural resources in a sustainable manner. It's understood that when those languages become extinct, and right now nine languages a year or one every 40 days, cease to be spoken. And when that happens, precious, precious local knowledge is lost to humanity. In the past decade, at least one small language of Timor-Leste, the language of um, Makua, spoken in the, at the eastern tip of the island, has ceased to be spoken. And there's been a dramatic decline also in the usage of even some of the larger language groups uh, like Mumbai and Makasai, as intermarriage across ethnic groups occur and many families opt to communicate with their children in Tetum, the lingua franca. A tiny fraction of Timor Leste's state budget is allocated to um, cultural and linguistic preservation initiatives, perhaps not surprisingly really given uh, the pressing need to tackle other national priorities such as the prevalence of malnutrition and stunting in children. Having said that, to its credit, um, the Timor-Leste government has endeavoured to integrate the practice of um, Tarabandu, a system of traditional law regulating human interaction with one another and the environment, into a number of its programs. So approximately 70% of Timor-Leste's land has already been severely degraded by deforestation, overgrazing and agricultural practices. And in light of these challenges, it's become very important to develop strategies to manage um, societal, cultural and environmental changes. So Tarabandu sets prohibitions on matters of violence against persons and property and theft as well as disputes over land, land use and property, for instance, related to the cultivation of fields, water sharing, crop destruction by lab, livestock and unauthorised harvesting of forest products. So a committee, including representatives of youth and women, women's groups, oversees the prohibitions, as well as mediation processes and systems of monetary fines and other penalty, penalties that are also defined by these committees. Communication with ancestor spirits, which... Um, frequently accompanies these ritual practices associated with Tarabandu are almost exclusively conducted in the local language of the area. It's been a pleasure to work with Lisa Palmer on collecting the stories of some of these ritual practices and uh, information on um, traditional medicines, sacred houses, um, a whole host of wonderful folk tales in this book, which was recently launched in um, Dili in Timor-Leste, and I think Lisa may talk a little bit further um, about that. Thank you very much for listening to me today and happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm very unprepared. No notes, no slides. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, that I'm speaking to you today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. Um, I'm just returned from Central Australia where I've been um, conducting field research, a rarity for someone who holds a PVC Indigenous role, uh, around issues of culture, heritage and... Uh, the relationship really of Indigenous people in Central Australia to cultural tourism and the national economy. And although I'm not going to speak about language as such, um, I do have some insights to share and um, these insights really emerged out of 
multiple interviews that I conducted over the last couple of weeks with people who work in cultural tourism. Um, my project is based at Murijulu and Yulara, so um, Uluru Karajuda National Park. It's, um, it's a park that exists on the uh, traditional lands of the uh, Anangu, uh, Pidendara, uh, Yankandara people. Uh, Murijulu is a community that exists uh, or is situated 15 kilometres away from Yalara, or its other name, uh, Ayers Rock Resort. Uh, Ayers Rock Resort is a place uh, that employs between two and 3,000 people at any one given time, and its annual turnover is around $200 million. Uh, the airport at Ayers Rock uh, has around 300,000 people flying in from air and I would assume uh, more than that coming by ground transport. Uh, the resort has a number of uh, accommodation uh, possibilities from so-called five-star through to campgrounds. Uh, it is a place of money and affluence. 15 kilometres away, you have a community of traditional owner peoples numbering between two and 300, and that is a community uh, of third world or uh, likely even worse than third world um, conditions uh, in respect to some health issues and arguably education issues. So, I'm interested in why that's the case. Why in a very wealthy country like Australia that's just come out of a 30-year economic boom, uh, we think it's okay to have communities in this country that are in some respects worse off than communities in Africa or um, isolated parts of Asia. Uh, that's unacceptable to me. Now, part of the problem um, in terms of changing that situation economically uh, according to cultural tourism uh, industry folks is the language barrier. Uh, the people who live at Murijulu uh, don't speak English as their first language um, and in many cases don't speak English as their second, third or fourth language. They speak a variety of Western desert uh, languages and dialects, and English is way down the track. Uh, this creates a significant issue in terms of current uh, pathways to employment in and around cultural tourism, either working at Ayers Rock Resort in uh, front of desk service positions, or any position indeed, or on the National Park as a park ranger or administrator for Parks Australia. So how do we overcome this um, is part of uh, what my research uh, project is trying to uh, grapple with. And it, it seems to me that uh, one of the blockages for valuing Indigenous uh, knowledge and Indigenous language uh, as part of that knowledge base is that there's no economic requirement or value uh, seen in Indigenous knowledges in Australia to any great extent. Um, and the practical example of this at Yalara and Murijulu is that you can be a guide taking visitors out and around Uluru or Karajuda uh, you can do this in English. Uh, most of the guides are actually backpackers from some other place or um, young people from Melbourne, Brisbane or Sydney, uh, usually not Indigenous, usually uh, settler Australians. Uh, almost no knowledge of uh, local uh, culture, environment, place, history, etc., etc. 
So in that context, there's no need uh, for the industry to uh, value and call upon Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous language to enhance the visitor experience. In other places, in other parts of the world, that's not the case and it's changing. And one example I'll give you is Dene or Navajo people in the southwest of the United States um, who have, through agreement with uh, the industry there and parks there, made it a requirement for all guides working in their part of the world to undergo a Dene language course so that when they guide people out to places in the Grand Canyon, they are able to reference place through uh, traditional names and even speak to some uh, Navajo concepts uh, as they're guiding people. So I think uh, there's a huge issue in Australia in terms of uh, joining the dots uh, between Indigenous knowledge, including language, and creating economic value for those things. At the moment, and universities and higher education has been a large part of creating this problem, I would say. At the moment, Indigenous knowledge is seen as something uh, to be protected and cared for and then put in a glass cage as something um, that doesn't actually have a use beyond knowing it uh, for knowing its sake, you know. It, it has a value as an end in itself, not as a tool that might be used to create new opportunities and new futures for Indigenous people. So I, I, I know people in my faculty, the Faculty of Arts, hate me talking about this, but the future for Indigenous people, as it was in the past, in part is an economic future. And uh, Indigenous people, believe it or not, uh, used country for economic purposes to sustain their way of life. And we need to get back to that in, in the present day and in the future. Um, people uh, need wealth uh, and they need um, to see how their identity, their country, their language, their knowledge uh, can create viable futures for themselves. At the moment, that doesn't exist. So I, I don't need to go through all the statistical data about uh, where Aboriginal kids sit nationally or in the Northern Territory, but kids don't go to school, and I think there's a reason. Uh, there's a disconnect between who they are and what they're learning, um, and uh, that doesn't mean they don't need to uh, learn English to uh, engage with the global uh, community, but uh, they need to see value in their own language and their own knowledge systems, and I think that is possible. Uh, what we often forget when we think about Uluru um, is that it's... Value is not just in terms of the environment, but it's also in terms of its cultural heritage. So if uh, language and uh, cultural knowledge is lost, uh, does that mean that Uluru ceases to have uh, world heritage uh, values in terms of culture? Maybe it does. Um, I'll end it there. I've rambled enough. Thank you. <laughs> great. Thank Is this working? Yeah, great. Thank you, Barry and Kirsty and Rachel. Um, as uh, Sangeetha introduced me, my name's Lisa Palmer, and I'm privileged to be the deputy lead um, in this theme research, which is generously funded through the Indigenous Knowledge Institute. Barry. Uh, is the lead uh, researcher on the topic of prompting or promoting Indigenous cultural and heritage through valuing uh, Indigenous knowledge. 
And I think we can see this um, beautiful uh, range of synergies threading here through these presentations that we've had, starting with language, I think very importantly, talking about language in the way that it is underpinned by knowledge systems and promulgates particular ways of being in the world, talking about the values of education um, linked to those languages in another country context, being Timor-Leste, a country that's only an hour away from Darwin, so a near neighbour context, a, a country that um, I began my work in um, under the supervision of uh, Professor Marcia Langton in Kakadu National Park 25 years ago. Many of the issues that Barry was just talking to us about then were the same issues that I encountered in Kakadu 25 years ago and, and are probably still similar issues that communities there are encountering. Encountering. I move across to uh, carry out research in Timor-Leste over the last 10 or 15 years. One of the world's newest nations, an indigenous-led nation, if you like, after they've uh, thrown off the shackles of Indonesian colonialism, but nonetheless still fo um, facing many of these same you know, fundamental, foundational issues around the ways in which Indigenous culture, heritage, language and knowledge can be valued. And I think that Barry has really um, drawn our attention to the centrality of um, people, communities, needing to be able to generate economic opportunities out of the ways, these ways of being, these ways of... Um, connecting with each other and the wider world. So what we're trying to do in this theme, I think Barry can co correct me if I'm wrong, is to really foreground the ways in which Indigenous organisations around Australia and in places like Timor-Leste, uh, uh, the aspirations that they have for creating these kind of economic opportunities to live on country, to communicate uh, with each other and with others about country, whether that's through caring for country programs, whether that's through cultural tourism, whether that's through language and education programs. And we want to be able to bring those Indigenous organisations, communities into conversation with each other. So there's so much research that gets done in these kind of places. Uh, but what we want to do in this research is to hand over the reins of um, those processes to Indigenous organisations to uh, carry out their own research uh, in, in, uh, with the support of people like ourselves here at the University of Melbourne. And you can see what a great wealth of uh, research support there is through the presentation that Rachel uh, gave you this morning. Um, but to really enable these communities to uh, generate their own research and to bring them into conversation with each other. Um, I'll hand over to, to Barry to maybe pick up some of that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I didn't talk about the theme much, but um, uh, our theme is is really about um, empowering Indigenous uh, groups, organisations, communities to undertake uh, research that they think is uh, valuable and that they want to carry out around uh, the theme of Indigenous knowledge, culture and heritage. So um, I did, I think... I tried to uh, uh, link those things uh, to uh, economic empowerment. I think one of the one of the issues in Australia is that uh, either by design or by default, um, this country continues to operate a system of internal colonisation whereby the expectation is that Indigenous people will leave their country if they seek, uh, uh, you know, a, a higher material uh, uh, lifestyle. Uh, they will leave their country and they will need to go to a major metropolitan city to gain employment and a high level of education. And I guess um, at, at a very basic level, our theme is about um, investigating how Indigenous knowledge, uh, language, um, understandings of country or environment um, can be um, re-engineered in the Australian mindset from being a deficit into being a value-add economically and culturally and for 
national identity, if you like. So uh, I think we're really interested in working with people um, who are committed to staying in their own place, on their own country, and making those places viable. Because what I see at the moment is um, the economics of terra nullius, where Indigenous people are being forced to move off country and we're going to achieve a kind of terra nullius if that economic process continues. And I, I don't see that as being to anyone's advantage, uh, really. Do we really want to uh, have a continent uh, where every Australian lives in a place like Melbourne and um, an hour or two away from this place, uh, what we have is vacant country where there are no people, there are no communities, there is no culture, there is no language because there's no one there to do those things. Um, but that's where we're heading and um, I, I think in the context of, of the global issues that we're confronting, uh, we should work against uh, those kind of um, movements and agendas. Sometimes they're, they're political agendas that are put in place by governments. Um, the Northern Territory government had a, a place, a policy, a policy around place called growth centres. Uh, where their policy meant the end of outstations, essentially. Um, and I think that's wrong. Uh, it just creates so many issues for regional centres like Alice Springs. It's not good for Aboriginal people or anyone else. OK. Um, so... Uh, thank you, Barry. And um, I think we've, we're nearly at time. We have about five minutes left. So I think we'll t uh, now take some questions from the audience, uh, whether in the room or online. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that. Um, Barry, I just wanted to ask you, did you have, um, uh, were you able to look at the um, dilution and perhaps even more dangerously, the misinformation um, that is spread by, you know, these so-called, ba like these backpackers and people that are just, I mean, that's just so dangerous um, because it's filtering to the rest of the world community. Yeah, one of the things that um, I I did pick up on was the butchering of uh, Pindara pronunciations uh, when attempted, rarely attempted, uh, but uh, when attempted, a really bad job. And I, I thought maybe it's better that they don't try and speak uh, language words in some situations. But more, I, I was thinking the actual culture and the significance of the land being misinterpreted completely. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think it is. Um, the the Anangu uh, perspectives on country and the significance of Uluru as a sacred place or a collection of sacred places, actually, because there are many sites, both men and women's, at various points around uh, the rock, are uh, almost invisible to visitors. So uh, m my feeling is that most visitors who go to Uluru get the whitefella dreaming experience of the rock as this um, important sacred site to the whitefella nation, if you like. Um, and that's highly problematic for Indigenous people and knowledges, isn't it, because Uluru is a collection of sacred sites. There's no denying it. But as, as we all know, uh, right across this continent and its surrounding islands are sites that are sacred to people. And so there is no centre point uh, from an Indigenous knowledge perspective. 
um, all these places are part of a, a web of interconnected places. But they, they definitely don't get that in the main from these uh, guides. Um, and Indigenous perspectives and knowledges um, pretty much remain invisible to most visitors. Uh, the point where they may get it um, in a very um, disconnected way is if they purchase some central desert art from one of the upmarket galleries at the resort. Um, we have another question specifically for Kirsty and Rachel. Um, you've spoken very eloquently about um, the importance of First Nations people being able to learn in the language that is, or languages that are most meaningful for them. Do you have any comments on how important it is for um, settler society to be learning the First Nations languages on the country that they live? Uh, yeah. Um, it's a it's a difficult question to answer because it's, uh, I mean my 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 first answer would be it's a decision for individual indigenous communities on individual lands, um, the extent to which they want to have other people learning their language. So it's not sort of my place to say that, but I think it's really important that settler populations in Australia have an appreciation of the diversity and the value of Indigenous languages. And then um, I think it's uh, about, you know, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of communities across Australia and I don't think we can have a one-size-fits-all approach to the question of whether uh, there are people in each community who want to be teaching their language to others. Um, I'll leave that to individual communities. But I think it's certainly important that all Australians really appreciate and understand how amazing and um, valuable and precious the Indigenous languages are. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. That was an absolutely fascinating set of conversations that really brought very nicely multiple themes together. Um, I'd like you to join me in thanking Barry, Kirsty, Rachel and Lisa. And if you want to find out more about the themes that Barry and Lisa are leading, you can go to the website. Uh, it's now time for lunch. We only have one hour for lunch, so um, I'd like to see you back in here at 1.30 and please enjoy the lunch. Thanks. <laughs>